All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so a bit of a different session today. In, in this course, as in other courses you've taken at university, you're encouraged, we've talked about it, to read scientific papers, so to read papers in the actual scientific, the primary scientific literature. You, you're also tasked, of course, with writing up your own research project in the style of... Um, of a short scientific paper. So what we're going to do today is really look at what we mean by the scientific literature. So I'm going to explain the peer review process. Um, I'm going to talk about the different types of academic journals to help you understand your, when you're doing your reading. I'm going to talk about how to write up a research project, some general advice about how to structure a, a, a write-up, um, and then give some tips as well on kind of how to get great marks, if you like, what we're looking for when we do the marking of these projects. And as you'll see, most of kind of what I'm going to cover is really quite general, so I hope it will be of use not only for this particular course, but, but, but beyond that as well in, in your other courses and beyond. So just briefly, to, to just step back and think in very general terms where we get our information from. We're going to try and place the scientific literature kind of within this cloud of information. So just to give some examples, we might get information from the government, say from um, national statistics and the like. What about information put out these days through the President of the United States, the seal of the President of the United States? We get a lot of information from social media as well. There's an obvious link here between the President and Twitter feeds. But a lot of information from Facebook, um, Twitter, and, and, and other social media. Think about um, information from news outlets as well. And contrast the kind of news outlets that uphold journalistic standards of verification of facts and sources from those outlets that are kind of peddling misinformation and fake news. Or do we even base understanding of, of, of the world on... Um, religious beliefs passed on from one generation to the text, uh, one generation to the next, based on ancient texts, pronouncements by religious leaders, and the like. And then we have information to garner from what we refer to as the scientific literature. And as I say, that's what I want to focus on today. Papers published in Science, Nature, Journal of Ecology, any number of journals that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, so how does this scientific literature fit into this broader cloud of information um, that, that, that we use to, to draw conclusions and, and, and generate our, our knowledge? So in effect, what I want to do is ask what's so special about the scientific literature. And let me just briefly illustrate just how poorly understood the answer to this question can be. So this is, a, um, this is an exchange at a, a hearing before the US House of Representatives Committee um, on uh, uh, Science, Space and Technology. They're addressing the question whether it's true that policies to reduce carbon emissions would reduce global temperatures. So Representative Larry Bouchon commented, well, there are public comments out there that that question has been addressed, it's been asked and answered saying no. To which Professor John Holdren, who was the chief scientific advisor to President Obama, said, well, you should look at the scientific literature rather than the public comments. And I think I make the point because it's kind of remarkable that that point needs to be made before the US House um, of Representatives Committee on Space, Science and Technology, who you would hope would know these kinds of things. But what I want to do is then ask, well, what, what do we mean by the scientific literature and what's so special about it? Well, one thing that makes it so special, if you like, is the idea of, of peer review or the process of peer review. So um, let's just um, talk through really what we mean by peer review. So these are articles that have been through peer review, that appear in scientific academic journals. What's that process? What, what, what do we mean by peer review? Well, so we have our scientists that does some empirical research, might run some models, might... Uh, go out and do some field work, collect some primary data, might run some experiments, write up, writes up their article 
and submits it to a journal. The process is then essentially as follows. That, that manuscript will go to the editorial office, who will perform some basic checks for, is it complete, are all the parts there, is it, um, you know, are the figures there, is, is everything in place, and then pass on um, the majority of, of articles to the editor, who will make an initial decision to check, well, whether that paper fits within the scope of the journal. Is it something that fits? You know, if you're a journal of ecology, is it on the kind of ecology that that journal usually publishes? The editor would then usually pass the work, the, the, the paper, on to an associate editor who's going to have a more detailed look at the manuscript, who's going to do a check. Does the research presented seem to be sound? Are there any obvious flaws? Um, is it going to be of general interest to the readership of the journal? And if so, they will then select reviewers. Um, bear in mind that editors, associate editors, aren't usually paid. They're usually people like myself or people who have academic positions at universities might get a bit of a supplement on top of their salary, but it's not usually their, their job to be an editor or, or, or an associate editor. That's different at some journals, some of the kind of so-called top journals like Science and Nature, where they will have professional editors. But it's people like myself in a, in a research position at universities and, and, and professors at universities who are, who are taking on this role of, of, of whether to pass on information to, um, to reviewers. Reviewers, by contrast, uh, or, or certainly aren't paid. Reviewers, it's a kind of service to the field, um, to the scientific process. It's something that we're expected to contribute to the scientific process, to do reviews. So we're constantly asked to do reviews for journals. So the associate editor will select some reviewers who will be people who are um, qualified, who <coughs> usually have a PhD, um, who've published themselves in this particular field so that they would be classed as experts in this particular field and they would be asked to evaluate independently um, uh, the, the, the scientific report. So they're going to ask questions like, are the data that, that have been used appropriate? Have the analyses been run correctly? You know, are the statistics right? Have they used the right statistics? Have they done the right kinds of tests? Do the conclusions follow from the results? The conclusions that the paper draws, do they actually really follow from the results that are presented? And then is the work placed within the context of previous studies? And we'll talk about the scientific process as a, a way of placing your work within the existing body of knowledge. So the reviewers will read in, in with hopefully great care. The manuscript will send back comments to the journal. Sometimes it might be just... A, a, a couple of paragraphs, sometimes people will write quite a few um, uh, pages even um, of, of comments on, 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 on that manuscript. The associate editor at the journal will then take that information, will take those reports, usually two or three, sometimes four, not usually just the one, evaluate them and make a recommendation to the editor, who will then act on that saying what the associate editor says and what the reviews say, what the recommendation is, and, and put forward a, um, a conclusion or a decision that will be sent to the authors. And those decisions, to boil it down to the usual, would be reject. The reviewers and the, the editor, the associate editor, have identified some flaws. The statistics aren't right. The logic isn't right. Um, the protocols for doing the experiments weren't, weren't done correctly in which case the paper would be rejected. At the other end of the, the extreme, the paper might be accepted. The reports were glowing. There aren't any major problems. Maybe some recommendations to change some wording or um, change some small elements of, of, of the work we refer to as minor corrections. Um, and that would be the decision that is essentially accepted subject to the authors making some corrections. Or a very common response is we'll make some major revisions. So the reviewers are saying, well, this is potentially interesting, but we think the stats need to be done differently, or we think you need to do this extra test to check whether this alternative explanation might be valid. So this is the kind of process. Um, when that decision goes back, excuse me, when that decision goes back to the authors, there's then a revision process. So the authors will take that, those reviews back, take those comments back, and usually get 
up to three months or four months or, or, or so to make some revisions where they'll somewhat um, you know, address point by point all of the comments that have been made, potentially run reanalyses. And then it will go back to the journal. They might resubmit three or four months later and the process continues. Basic checks, um, have, the, have, the, um, uh, have the revisions been carried out correctly um, or, or at least have they been addressed? Usually that will then go back to the reviewers, who the reviewers will then look at the revised manuscript, have the problems been addressed, have new problems come up, and eventually this will come back to the editor, um, a recommendation to the editor, you know, should this manuscript be accepted or um, rejected. So this is the process, this is what we mean by reading the primary scientific literature. It's, it's papers that have been through this process. Um, to try and identify papers that should be published. So what we're saying is, you know, these are the papers that you should, certainly at this stage in studying, reading for your degrees, these are papers that you should be looking at, the primary literature. Next question then, does it, does it matter which academic journal a study is published in? Well, there is a hierarchy, if you like, a hierarchy of kinds of journals based on reputation and based on what we refer to as impact factor, which is essentially, it's kind of an index of how many times papers that are published in that journal are subsequently cited by other papers in that journal and in all the other journals. So high impact journals and high impact papers are cited by lots of other sources. Excuse me, by lots of other papers. So you get journals at the very top, such as Science and Nature, um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, they usually general science journals, so they cover a really broad um, set of, 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 of topics. And then as you kind of move down this hierarchy, there are within our field of ecology and evolution, conservation biology, there are um, more specialised journals in our field that aren't as high impact as science and nature, but they are the kind of premium journals in this field, journals like Trends in Ecology and Evolution, Ecology Letters, Global Change Biology, this is by no means an exhaustive list, I'm trying to give you the kinds of journals to look at and how to understand the journals that you're reading. And then below that you have, again, they, these are all very you know, prestigious, well-regarded journals, but probably the next tier down, Journal of Ecology, Journal of Biogeography, Proceedings of the Royal Society. Um, so there is this kind of hierarchy and, and in the kind of scientific world that, you know, academics are working in, we're always trying to get our work published in the, in the most high impact, the best journal, the most prestigious journal that we can. And an important point is that the peer review process is highly selective, certainly among these more prestigious journals. So for example, about 8% of the manuscripts that are submitted to Nature eventually get published. So less than 1 in 10 of the manuscripts that get submitted, and people are usually submitting the kind of cream of their work, you know, the, 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 the best um, work that you do, only about one in ten of those manuscripts actually end up going through this peer review process and getting published in a journal like Science or Nature. Global Change Biology, to give you another um, kind of point, is, is about 20% success rate. It's about 20% of the manuscripts that are submitted um, end up being published in the journal. So this peer review process is, is highly selective. But bear in mind that what I'm kind of showing you is the, is the kind of top of a hierarchy, top of a pyramid, if you like. Um, those journals that I'm showing, again, are all kind of highly reputable. They're all high-impact journals. But there really is a fairly broad base to this pyramid, to this hierarchy of journals. And I'll just flag a, a point that's been made um, by several people, and, and, and there was a nice letter that was published in, in Nature back in 2004 that referred to the dirty secret of academic publishing. So this is the idea that you can kind of get almost, you can get almost anything in print if you go far enough down the ranks of journals. So the concern really is that many of the low impact journals don't provide the same kind of quality peer review, peer review process that more, the more prestigious and well regarded journals do. So I think the point is that Really, the answer to this question, does it matter which journal you're looking at, kind of is yes. Now, there certainly are, of course, exceptions. There are really fantastic papers that get published in the lower-impact journals, and high-impact journals occasionally publish 
papers that turn out to be rather poor. But in general, to guide your reading, you should be looking at the more high impact, the more prestigious journals. Um, you should be focusing a lot of your, your reading on those journals for these reasons. So if it is published in a top peer-reviewed paper, uh, sorry, in a top peer-reviewed journal, it must be true, right? Having been through this peer review process, well, not necessarily, of course. Because um, the real challenge comes in the long run. The peer review process acts as a kind of first hurdle, but the real challenge comes in the long run after the work has been published. So can the findings be replicated? Do new studies confirm or contradict the conclusions? <coughs> can alternative theories explain the findings. So this is how the scientific process works. New papers get written, they challenge or they confirm what we think we already know. Those studies go through peer review, go through this same process. Those that are deemed acceptable get published and so the scientific process kind of um, moves forward and um, in theory knowledge advances. So those are all the kinds of things that I think it's important to bear in mind as you are reading and trying to digest and understand and targeting your reading of the primary scientific literature. 